All right, lovely. Hi, uh, welcome. It's so nice to see so many of you with us today uh, for the third webinar in our series of the power of feminist narratives from fragmentation to solidarity. My name is Vandita Mararka, and I'm the moderator for this series. Last Tuesday, we held a webinar on the power of activism for human rights, um, the joint fight for bodily integrity and self-determination with Dan and Jeevika. It was a warm and insightful conversation and do stay tuned in for any insights we will be releasing from that soon. Before we look at the webinar theme for today, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the continuing devastations that are occurring across the globe, especially in Turkey and Syria recently. It has been a moment of loss and grief for people world over. Uh, we've been witnessing war, disaster, and it's been constant and continuous. And we know that it's a difficult time. Keeping this in context, uh, we understand that it is a privilege to be able to have this conversation. And we're very grateful for each of you to be here today and to join us in this conversation. Our theme for today's webinar is the power of feminist research, understanding its implications in shaping public discourse. Feminist research has existed for really long. And the beautiful part about it is that it focuses on issues that are often overlooked by other academic work. And it puts a limelight on power relations and analyzes what structures and cultural norms support patriarchy and intersectional discrimination. Feminist research in the way it's carried out challenges overall dominant academic methodologies, which are mostly developed by men and opens doors for new insights and new solutions, which leads to social, economic, and political change. How important is an intersectional analysis in overcoming constructed binary categories? What is the role of language in changing the knowledge landscape of sexuality and gender? What kind of translation do feminist researchers have to do in order to make feminist narratives more inclusive? These are the big questions that our panelists will be dealing with today as we deep dive into them with each of you. I'm very excited to welcome our panelists for today. We have Evren Safshi, um, who is an assistant professor of women, gender, and sexuality studies at Yale University. And we have Shams Abdi, who are an affiliated professor teaching literature at the university, a feminist activist who is a part of several intersectional and cure feminist movements and collectives from Tunisia. So nice to have both of you with us, welcome. Um, before we deep dive into this panel, I'm going to be taking us through a couple of housekeeping rules since it's a lot of us on the panel. Um, in the interim, I would encourage all our participants to use the chat to share your name, where you're joining us from. If you feel comfortable, rename yourself with your pronouns. And we'd love to get a sense check of how you're feeling today, how your day has been. I will give you all 10 seconds to start that off. Great. Um, so a couple of housekeeping uh, information slash rules. Um, if you feel comfortable, please do rename yourself with your name and pronoun. Interpretation is available in Spanish. Um, you can choose the Spanish language channel by clicking on the globe at the bottom of your screen. We will have time at the end for participant Q&A, uh, but we're happy to take questions throughout the panel conversation as well. So please keep the questions coming. You can use the main chat to share it. However, if you feel there's a question you don't want to share openly in chat, you can DM it to me, you can message it to me, and I will uh, document it and see when I can bring it up. There's also a community wall where you can engage with throughout or even after the webinar. You can leave your thoughts, questions, feelings over there and engage with each other and participants across different webinars over there. Lovely. I'm seeing a couple of people dropping in uh, messages in the chat. Thank you. Oh, I love that. We have someone from Uganda. We have someone from Ireland. I love that the sun is shining there. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. Um, please keep that coming in. We'd love to get to know all of you while we start off. Uh, but now to Evren and Shams, I'm going to kick us off with a question. Um, but please do take this moment to say hi as well. Um, share a little bit about your work if you like. So my question is simple. Um, how do you evade the limiting binaries of traditional and modern, authentic, colonial, global and local, and East and West when you do feminist research. Um, perhaps Shams, you wanna go first? Okay, hello everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is uh, Shams, which in Arabic, it means uh, sun. I'm joining from Tunis, Tunisia. 
the weather is sunny, but it's actually too sunny. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yes, we're uh, we are currently having a sad moment here because we lost a feminist two days ago. Her name is Rim Hamruni. She's a feminist activist. So uh, I wanted to say her name here so that everybody knows about her. Uh, about the limiting binaries of traditional, modern, authentic, colonial, global, local, and east-west in the feminist research. I think one of the first steps to do is to trust ourselves and trust our own narratives as a starting point. Uh, I think that for Tunisia, for so many years, most of our feminist references, they came from France, which, ha which, is, which still exists with its overall colonial power, uh, whether uh, materially or even at the level of ideas. And uh, one of the things that the feminist research maybe has been doing was to take theory as a starting point and kind of try to um, apply that theory in different contexts. Uh, well, the idea, I think, is to kind of look at our own lived experiences, look at our own stories and trust our own narratives and see uh, and, and start from there and build from there. Uh, this is something that we have been trying to do, for instance, with one of the recent works um, that I was part of, which is a booklet on intersectionality. And uh, with, uh, and you know, the word now intersectionality has been causing a lot of debates in several circles. Um, is it dividing us? Is it bringing us together, et cetera? And one of the main criticisms that have been articulated towards, uh, and I'm using this just as, as an example, of course, one of the main criticisms that have been articulated by universal feminists here in Tunisia with regard to intersectionality, it's this idea that it is that intersectionality is itself is an important uh, concept and does not really correspond to the lived realities of women. And all the research that has been done on an, on an international level has been done in um, other contexts. Uh, what we have been trying to do was to kind of not completely reject, for instance, the theory and practice and methodology of intersectionality, but kind of look at our own experiences and see whether those experiences can be described or can qualify as intersectional or not. So just to summarize, I think the idea here was instead of looking um, uh, for theoretical references and try to kind of... Uh, uh, apply them on our different contexts. I think it's it would be nicer to look at our own experiences and see what elements of those experiences are solid enough in order to build a theory of their own and in order to build a theoretical insight that is capable of competing with other, not competing, but capable at, let's say, occupying a place uh, or the space with other hegemonic um, theoretical insights. Thank you, Shams. I really appreciate that. Um, I will take thoughts from Evren and then share some. Go ahead, Evren. Um, thank you so much. I also wanted to quickly say um, hi to everyone and that it's so nice to be here with you um, today, this uh, early morning for me. For me. I'm um, from Turkey, but I do work in the US and I'm calling in from um, Connecticut, which unfortunately is very gray and rainy, unlike Tunisia. Um, my name is Evran Savju, and I um, really, really appreciate this dialogue. And I'm also looking forward to the Q&A moment. Mandita, also thank you so much for acknowledging what's going on in Turkey and Syria. Um, it's um, it's nice to kind of, I guess, hold space, as they um, say in the US. I find that to be both like a nice and a bit of a strange thing. But but um, I don't know what else to say for um, people we have lost, for people who are trying to still survive in really um, difficult conditions um, at home um, in Turkey and in Syria. So um, so about the binaries, and then I, I had one quick thought about something that Sham said that I, it made me think about something. Um, so th the binaries um, of avoiding or avoiding the binaries, um, one way I tried to do that in my own research and writing has been through showing that the local itself is never homogenous and it's always multiple. So um, instead of evoking it as a certain, so in one of the chapters of my book, for instance, I talk about instead of thinking about this sort of the question of homosexuality, quoting quote, and the 
Muslim voice uh, about it, I show in one particular moment in time in 2000, well, during this period, 2008 to 2010, how the question of LGBT rights is brought up to challenge the demand for headscarf rights, actually, to ask women with, hats, uh, women, you know, pious Muslim women in Turkey uh, who want to have the right to wear the headscarf to public universities and public offices, whether they support LGBT rights. And I show uh, even that simple question, do you support LGBT rights, uh, brings up multiple answers that cannot be collapsed into each other. So, um, so to me, there is no such thing as the local. Um, another um, thing I try to also, another binary I try to be, get out of is liberal illiberal. Like I take discourses and try to show how they will, they have both elements in them. Um, and since my writing has been deliberately up against the authentic colonial binary, when it's applied to LGBT, subjects and activism in the so-called sort of global south um, since they have been pretty much accused as being made of informants at times or inauthentic um, subjects um, in some earlier scholarship I try to um, also write myself sort of out of this binary uh, by and, and you know this is not just politically a problem it's also intellectually absolutely a fallacious way of thinking. So I um, spent some time thinking about why it has been gays and lesbians, and in that particular scholarship, a bit less to a lesser extent trans people in the global south that have been seen as markers of colonial modernity and not a modern army, for instance, or a modern taxation system. So I find it a bit ludicrous, you know, in this contemporary moment in a temporarily post-colonial moment, even though the realities of it are also pretty neo-colonial, um, to say, to imagine that there is some um, kind of authentic, quote unquote, untouched by modernity um, space, um, like, or to imagine there has ever been for a long time, like there has been a space like that, like a golden age one can or should go back to. Um, like um, Shams, I'm also very interested in the lived reality. And I think it's very good for scholars to always remember that our categories of thought are exactly just that. They're just categories that we make up and we use for analysis, not for, a, you know, it's not a bad thing to have an analysis of the world, but it will always only be an approximation of the lived experience. So um, so I think it's always good to keep that in mind. And the one thought that I had, um, that's one thing that makes feminist and queer scholarship a little bit, um, especially if, if you're interested in the more post-structuralist thought is that um, the relationship between language and lived experience. So it's always a little bit tricky to navigate that. And maybe we'll talk more about that during the Q and A with, our participants if they're interested because we make sense of our own experiences through the categories we have available to ourselves. So it's a little bit of a, um, you know, um, a loop that can happen where the lived experience itself is shaped by the categories that we have available to ourselves at times. Um, so that too doesn't exist as a pure thing outside of language for me. But I think there still are ways to capture um, something and to be mindful of the fact that we're only getting close to it, but never really fully, fully capturing it. Thank you, Evan. Um, I think both of you, and I just want to say that your work background reflects so strongly in what you shared. And that's such an inspiration for me because something that I really struggled with all my life is that that bridge between like feminist praxis and feminist research and academia um, as someone who's done a bit of both. And it's just always been a struggle and to see both of you like bridge that and also be so comfortable with the ambiguity around that rather than saying, oh, this is how it should be. And let me give you this model on how it should be. It's very like inspiring and reflective for me um, as a researcher as well. Um, so really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, but in addition to that, I think something that 
me is also thinking of ourselves outside of this binary and to allow us this grace to say that these are categories we've made up um, and these are categories we're then allowed to question and to understand that it's an approximation as Evelyn you shared. And I think a little earlier when Sham shared about the importance of not thinking of first building theory and applying it to our lives, but to see our lives as a space from which theory and other forms of knowledge can emerge. I found that really powerful. And even the headscarf example. So just for context in India as well, there's been, and some of you may be aware, there's been a lot of political debate on even allowing young girls into schools wearing headscarf. And how do you then politicize that issue to further alienate different communities at the different intersections of margins saying, oh, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that issue? Rather than allowing them to find their commonalities and build bridges and sort of come together in solidarity to shape, to shape a larger feminist movement and to allow for those differences within this space as well. Thank you. Those were um, some great reflections. And uh, we also have a question for our participants before we go ahead. Um, I hope the question will uh, encourage some further questions from them towards y'all. The question is, has popular culture, which could be movies, books, any form of art, shaped or uh, reshaped how you engage with academic work? You can see the question up. And if y'all are voting yes, you can also use the chat to share some examples. Um, of what popular culture has helped you reshape your understanding. We're still getting some votes in, so we'll wait. We'll close the poll in 10 seconds. We've had almost 100 people respond to it now. Olivia, I think we can perhaps close the poll. Thank you. Okay, so you all can see that there's a big percentage, 69%, where we do feel like engagement with popular culture has reshaped how we engage with academic work. And that's a really beautiful way of thinking of how these gaps can be bridged. And what is the role of feminist research perhaps in bridging this gap as well and taking it to the mainstream? Um, those of you who've said yes, please do share some examples in chat. I'm seeing some come in. And I hope that by the end of this conversation, the others will be convinced the other way as well. All right. So I think related to this, um, a question for both of you, Evren and Shams, and maybe Evren, you can go first. Um, is what is an intersectional analytical approach in research good for? Like, what is the use of it? What does it help? And why is it important to understand the links between categories that we formerly thought of as separate? I think you shared a little bit about that. So to build on that would be really nice. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, I'm also trying to read what popular culture um, encourages and kind of entices people to read academic work, but maybe we'll have a um, summary of the chat later so that we can, I find that super fascinating. Uh, so, for me, intersectionality um, has always meant understanding systems of oppression as interlocking. Um, so, which means that there is no way to separate histories of capitalism from histories of racism, of gender, of sexuality, of um, nation state borders, which then inform citizenship and things like that. Uh, this is not just true for history, of course, it's also true for experiences today. Um, I think it's extremely important that we understand the links between these categories, uh, because as we were just mentioning, they're lived and experienced in a more kind of, to use maybe a bit of a contentious way, a total way. I don't mean totality exactly in the Marxist sense that there is no, or maybe in a crude Marxist sense that there's no room for breaks in it or ruptures in it. But there is, um, as Shams was saying, the way we experience the world is not natural. I mean, it's not naturally broken into categories anyways. Like that is something we did for, for reasons of analysis. So um, I think that um, it's also important and I, 
um, know we're going to be chatting about the significance of that for uh, for activism. But um, I have, I think there is also some kinship between forms of thought and intersectional analytical approaches, like such as Marxism. When I first read Marx as an undergraduate, it was very illuminating for me um, to watch someone do the work of saying, hey, you know, we might think that um, the state and the religious institutions and education and the family are separate spheres, but I'm gonna show you how they operate to various, according to very similar logics. Um, there are really excellent scholars who show the, um, not just the in, individual experience bit of it. And I sometimes um, worry when intersectionality, especially in um, popular spheres, goes into only the individual experience. So like, for instance, as a queer person of color, this is how I experience the world, which is part of the story, but intersectionality is always about structures of inequality and how they distribute even uneven life chances and resources to people. So I think it's good to keep in mind the structuralism. And I'll say one, one thing towards that, but um, very quickly, if, if I may. So I'm working, I'm finishing a piece. <clears throat> I was, um, I'm writing as a response to another piece by Denis Candioti for an edited collection that's gonna come out probably in about a year, in which I reflect how when we go from structures of inequality um, and intersectional structures of inequality to um, focusing on how they produce individualized injury, sometimes, oftentimes, I think actually, we lose sight of how we ourselves are um, complicit, whether we choose it or not, in systems of inequality, because that's just the how, the, how the world is built. So I find myself often telling my students, you know, um, as you sit here and, you know, use your high technology phones to, you know, I don't know, look something up or, or like your computers, let's say, um, you don't even know who you're oppressing, but you certainly are because that's just how global capitalism works. Some people are laboring to make those gadgets cheaply enough for you to be able to consume. And there's a reason why you can afford it here and someone else, somewhere else in the world. So you don't choose to do this, obviously. None of you choose to oppress anybody somewhere else in the world, but that is just how the system is set up. So I think that to me, intersectional structural analysis also always reminds us of our participation and our place in these systems so that we understand that at, even as we might find ourselves in the more oppressed quote unquote categories, um, we are inevitably perpetuating um, some of these um, as well without realizing just like through living in these systems. So, um, so the, I think it's really um, important to see these links. Also materially, one last example, um, there are a couple of videos I, show, I uh, use in my teaching that were put out by Barnard um, on neoliberalism. I'm happy to put them in the, in the chat. I find them super useful. I, I teach them in my neoliberalism and sexuality class uh, in one of which um, Dean Spade, who is a um, radical trans um, kind of um, studies scholar and, and um, legal activist says, you know, the law might tell you that there is no connection between the immigration system and the criminal system, because one is a civil law and one is a criminal law. But when you look at who owns the immigrant detention centers and who owns the private prisons, you realize they're the same companies. So then there's a particular material way in which even though the law might divide these things up, the um, material, like capitalist material reality actually unites them. So when you look at who benefits, also in material ways from these systems much more explicitly, um, you see these connections. Sorry if this was a bit of a lengthier um, response, but these are a few things that come to my mind. Thank you, Avril. No, um, no apologies at all. I think that was really informative. Um, I also really liked how you bought in, like even the prison industrial complex and Dean Spade, whose work on mutual aid, I've really um, admired. 
Yes, thank you for that. Shams, please go ahead. Thank you. No, it wasn't lengthy at all. I actually enjoyed every single minute of it. Um, well, I, I relate to a lot of what has already been said already, especially what you mentioned, Vandita, about this um, in between space that we are in between activism and academia. And I'm actually one of those people who wake, who wake up every day and decide that they're going to give up on academia, but then eventually they, they don't. Um, well, for me about intersectionality or let's say the intersectional analytical approach, of course, we're not going to go deep into the concept and its history and all of that. But uh, honestly, I do not take the concept of intersectionality as one homogeneous uh, concept. Um, my brain kind of divides it into three different concepts to three different definitions. The first one, it has to do with the word and it only exists in the discursive space, in the way we speak about things, in the way we describe things. And this word, uh, it can be beneficial to our struggles as much as it can be also not that beneficial if it is considered as a mere buzzword that is only there um, uh, to, to, to show that something is trendy, to show that something is fashionable. And this is something that in activist circles we have been experiencing a lot, especially since the adoption of uh, the UN of the term. And it, it, it's kind of everywhere uh, now. And, 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 and even the groups who do not identify as feminist, who, who do not identify as intersectional, there's this kind of... Um, obligation to identify as intersectional in order to get the funds or in order to be able to work or or any of that. So that's not what we're talking about right now. Not the word as something that only have uh, that only has a discursive value. And there's also the intersectionality as a methodology, which is what your question is about here, I think, the analytical approach, which again differs from one context to another, depending on the realities of people, depending on who is using that intersectional method or that intersectional methodology and for what purpose are they using it. So, uh, and then the third thing, which for me is the most interesting, it's intersectionality as a practice, as a grassroots practice, and also as an academic practice, and I love the example that you have mentioned, Evan, um, with regard to Karl Marx, because that's also how I learned intersectionality, uh, uh, to be honest. Uh, so intersectionality as a practice, I think it has been there way before the concept emerged in the 80s. And I think it has been practiced before it got uh, before it became this pompous and fashionable, um, fashionable word, it has it was practiced by people who were on the ground fighting a, a daily fight in order to change their own realities. And I think that if we really uh, become aware of that element, then our, oh, I mean, our overall take on intersectionality is going to change. Again, I want to bring you to the Tunisian context, for instance. Intersectionality has been there since uh since the the um uh, uh, fighting against french colonization and then intersectionality as a practice became part of the tissue um not tissue part of the fabric of grassroots groups without them necessarily labeling themselves as intersectional and this is what i think is uh, to be taken into consideration in any intersectional analytical approach uh, in research so if this approach is going to take this into consideration then i think we would we can do great things with it but if not then i really do not think uh, where uh, it's going because uh, here uh, we say we speak about categories that were formerly thought of as separate well actually I don't think that those categories were, were really thought of as separate. I think that from the beginning, they are not thought of as separate in the activist circles or in grassroots groups. I think that it's activism or it's, it's, uh, uh, it's academia or theorization or when people started analyzing those social movements, those grassroots movements, that the separation between the different categories started to happen. For instance, I come from a country with a strong uh, history uh, of dictatorship for over 50 years and under dictatorship 
I think it will be, I, I, maybe it's an overstatement to, to say so, but I think that everybody was intersectional at some point because that's what you gotta do in order in order to be able to, to move around the system. Um, so yeah, this is what I have to say with regard to this. I think it's great. I think it would be great to focus on the practices and then out of those practices to, to, to kind of develop um, an analytical approach. This is, I mean, I, mean, I don't know if, I have expressed myself clearly. <laughs> no, you have. You've expressed yourself very clearly. Thank you, Shams. Um, before I go ahead, there's a question in chat uh, for you, uh, which is, could you elaborate on the second point of intersectionality as a method and the question of who is using it and for what purpose? And if you have any resources or tips around that, but if you could just expand on it, that would be useful. Yeah, would you like to go ahead, Shams? Can you repeat, please? I'm sorry, Vendita. No Is worries. it the question about elaborating the second point? The question by Lisa. Okay, great. Um, who is uh, second point intersectionality as a method and the question of who is using it and for what purpose? As I said earlier, intersectionality as a method has now become transversal or existent in all, in all uh, departments at university, but also in research that is being conducted by civil society organizations and by independent groups. So here, when I speak of research, it's not just university, it's not just academia, it is also, uh, it's the general term of, of research. Recently, what we have been um, having here in Tunisia is uh, the fact is it's the idea that certain people or certain researchers uh, who do commissioned research will use the intersectional lens, but not in order to really describe or, or analyze the realities of people, but just for it to be labeled as intersectional or just for it to uh, uh, to have um, a hegemonic position in the world of research and academia. What I would advocate for is to do it the other way around, to start from the lived, the lived experiences of people and to start from the practice and then move to the method or uh, to, the, um, to the analysis. Uh, and here about the purpose as well. Well, I am someone who's very political and who's very politicized. I'm not going to, to lie about that. And I think that the purpose of, of using the intersectional method is to make a statement and to make a political statement. Now, what has been, what is being done sometimes is that it is just used uh, in order to do a mere description and then stop at that point. And this has somehow depoliticized the term, depoliticized intersectionality. And also it has only, it, uh, it has depoliticized intersectionality in the way that it, it only brought it to the personal level. Um, I can give you an example. Now, most conversation about intersectionality that is happening right now in activist circles or in academia has to do with privileges, with personal privileges, etc. It's it's true. It's great. I do believe in it as well. But at the same time, it's more than that. Intersectionality, it's not just about uh, individuals being privileged or underprivileged. It's about structures of oppression that operate in a highly complicated and complex way in a society. That on one hand. On the other hand, especially... Uh, well, we know that with the article of Kimberly Crenshaw and how intersectionality started and how people started applying it, they mostly spoke of discrimination and oppression. But um, I think that a big component has been uh, left out, which is the component of exploitation, which kind of brings about, uh, which kind of uh, bring, uh, gives intersectionality uh, a sense of identity in the realm of political economy as well, which is important. So for me, I think that if we use the word just to describe the intersection of discriminations, uh, discrimination and then the need to, of the intersection of struggle, I think it's not enough and that the term is much more politicized than that and must also address uh, the issue of exploitation and must also be present in uh, the area of political economy as well. Thank you, Shams. That's really useful. Um, in fact, something that both of you shared and to bring that together was the balance between understanding systems of oppression at play and then also looking at our own individual roles. 
and what can we do to shift that and to not become a part of the structure of oppression um considering i'm also um, uplifting some of the comments in chat and the need to acknowledge where this theory originated from so thank you for doing that shams some um an author i recently read and i'm going to put the link in chat for others as well was jennifer nash and yes jennifer nash spoke about the need to perhaps move from and this is me paraphrasing it uh the need to move from just thinking about what intersectionality is to analyzing what intersectionality does because if we only keep focused on the first part of what intersectionality is that can sometimes just become an academic conversation without you know tangible consequences for like policy for infrastructure for social protection i will reshare a link uh, just give me a second uh but that was a beautiful book um and it also talks about the need to think of theory that has emerged from black feminists beyond intersectionality and the need to acknowledge their other contributions as well so i thought this was a good point to like share that as well um i think one of the other examples evren you shared with us uh, made me think about a conversation i was having last night with a bunch of feminists at a dinner table where one of them said that you know these phones are made in my country but it costs millions in my currency to be able to buy this phone so i have never owned one of these and it came up as a conversation because there was someone on the table who owned one of those phones and it's such a small example but it is such a large um, testimony to the exploitation we're all part of day in and day out and how sometimes there isn't an acknowledgement of that so thank you for bringing that up um i think the reason i asked the question about popular culture before this answer was also to bring up how popular culture can sometimes be a way to bridge these categories and a way to bring in that nuance that is sometimes not always as easily accessible through academic material i know we don't uh, we didn't ask you all a specific question on that but i'd love any thoughts from either of you on how popular culture or its usage might have influenced how you do research or how you disseminate research and get it to more people sorry for putting you all in the spot um either if you can take it first um wanted to a quick clarification question um do you mean popular culture itself or do you also mean the way in which we um use like social media like when you say dissemination mm -hmm. or popular culture i wasn't sure i would say both um so popular culture for sure um but interestingly someone shared on chat how feminist researchers are making tiktok videos to share their material so if you have any insight on that as well would be great um yeah i mean i think that um i am trained as a like social scientist and even though i think i think of myself as a um very interdisciplinary scholar i was not trained to use media or popular culture or even literature in my um teaching and research i do do it to an extent because i find it um fascinating but i think i might be like too boring me frankfurt school or something you know when it comes to popular culture so i i do usually see um you know I I do worry that we shifted from being interested in political representation to settling for being represented in TV shows and like you know when people in America especially when people say representation they no longer mean polit politics they mean do I see myself in films and TV shows I find these a little alarming but I also do find that since popular culture um is what gives people like socially right what gives people perhaps a common ground or common language through which them to talk about things um it is a bit like what newspapers used to do but but something else now that like if everybody's watching that one show then it can generate a particular kind of connection and conversation and that i find very 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 interesting um i also find the um use of social media to think about um various issues really interesting i'm still off the mind that i mean i'm i don't use tiktok i do use twitter i do use instagram um one more personally i would say but but I, so i do see 
the value of putting information on those platforms because of how quickly they can travel and reach um, really, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say everyone because I think it's delusional to think everybody has um, access to these or the time to sit down to, you know, people who work for jobs sometimes. Like, I'm not going to imagine everybody sitting in front of Twitter and reading um, political tweets, but it is <clears throat> still reaching a wide range. And, and it is, um, I'm just like, I find it useful. I always try to also point out that it can sometimes um, make us think that we're connected that, that when we're not. So I am still um, very old school in the sense that I like meeting people in person. I, I believe in like bodies being in the same space. Um, uh, but sometimes that can be facilitated through those, right? Conversations can be facilitated, facilitated through something that happened on a TV show everybody watches or through, um, you know, tweets or other social media um, structures people can gather. Um, and that I find valuable. This was a bit of a vague answer, but I hope uh, it'll do. No, it's really useful. I think the reflection on how um, even today, popular culture might still mean different things for different people. Um, and I especially, like if I was to give an example from India, um, I would give it in Hindi. The name of the show is uh, Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hu, which translates to I Can Do Anything. And then there's another show called Anupama, which is the name of the title character. And it's very interesting to me how much that has pushed feminist discourse, uh, because in a very dramatized style, it talks about um, how marital rape is wrong and how domestic violence is wrong. And what is interesting for me is also how media houses are now relying on feminist researchers in India to guide some of the scripts and the narratives for how the shows are developed. So I think that intersection is interesting as well. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, Shams, do you want to come in? Um, for me, it's midway, uh, to be honest. Uh, I think that uh, at some point we cannot neglect the fact that being connected or being online has done a lot of good stuff to the feminist movement here in Tunisia, at least. Um, I remember, for example, uh, in 2019, um, when we did the uh, flash mob of El Violador Eres Tu, we, we did our choreography on a, on a group on Facebook and we broadcasted it live. And we were just a bunch of uh, 15 girls meeting to do the choreography. And then we broadcasted it live to other girls and women. And we were shocked that the day of the choreography, 120 women showed up and they have all learned it by heart thanks to that live on the Facebook group. So I think that we cannot neglect the fact that um, without this, we wouldn't have reached all of those uh, women, especially if we speak of a context like Tunisia. And this is something that we also sometimes, and here I take it back to what Evren said about the local is plural and multiple. Um, the lived experiences of Tunisian girls and women as well are plural and multiple, and some of them are on a lifetime lockdown at home because they are women and because they are girls. And it, I mean, and without social media and without, uh, um, without social media, we wouldn't have been able to reach those girls and those women as well. Um, I was in Iraq last well i was in kurdistan last month in the, in, um, the no northern part of iraq and i have met a woman there who is um the the the, the director um, of a feminist school and all the lectures of the of the feminist school were happening online because they could not do them not online because none of the girls would have been able to attend so all of this is to take into consideration when speaking about um here i'm not talking about pop culture in general but about this being connected online kind of thing uh, but at the same time uh, i do believe that it has also had a negative effect on us uh, on those who are already there who are already activists or who are already in academia or, or, or who are already feminists that we take the uh, virtual space we, we since the virtual space is easier to access then we kind of neglect being with each other in the real space and we kind of neglect having a conversation in the real space. 
And uh, I'm telling you this because this is fairly recent now. Uh, one of our uh, comrades, she 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 made a statement and she said, I'm not willing to discuss anything with you unless it's not virtual, because we took um, we, we we kind of um, we enjoy the easiness of virtual gathering that we kind of we, we almost never meet now we ever we almost never have a conversation about things. So it's it's I, I, I wouldn't say it's a double edged sword. But I would say it's also uh, it's not as monolithic as um, we would like to think it to be, and there's definitely some good elements to it and some elements that uh, are rather uh, more challenging. Now, with regard to pop culture in general, and here I don't know you referring if you're referring to series and movies and all of that. I'm uh, a full adept of using pop culture in feminist research. Uh, because, I mean, for, for the mere aspect of its relatability, it is relatable. For instance, I have, I teach at university in Tunis and lots of my students, they don't read at all. And even when I mention references for books, for articles, etc., it wouldn't ring a bell, it doesn't ring a bell. However, when I mention a Netflix series or when I mention um, a movie, uh, it immediately rings a bell. So I think that for short-term impact, if you want to get an idea across and you have no other tools surrounding you, I think that pop culture uh, is a fairly um, relevant, uh, relevant tool, especially that it's... Uh, I don't want to say it's democratic because it's definitely not. It's 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 full of ideology all over the place. But I would say that it has this democratic form, this um, accessibility that uh, maybe written uh, material doesn't have, especially in light of institutional accesses to written materials, to articles, to books, etc. So yeah, I have no answer, I guess, but that's 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 what I have been experiencing. No, thank you. Um, I think you all are giving us some very insightful answers and then saying you don't have any. Um, they've been very, very useful to learn from. I think um when you know both of you shared, what I'm also hearing is that there's a bit of a influence of I would say even Western popular culture on how narratives are shaped, at least in my context and perhaps in other contexts as well. And we'll get that, get back to that in a bit. Um, Shams, actually, my next question is for you as well. Um, but before I ask you, maybe we can ask our participants a question. So I'm just going to put this in chat first. So it's a simple question. Um, since we're talking about intersectional feminism, we'd love to hear from participants what intersectional feminism means to you. You can just click on the Mentimeter link in chat and you should be able to leave your answers there. Um, we'll give it the next few minutes, um, but in the meanwhile, I will ask Shams my next question, but you can keep engaging with the Mentimeter link for a bit. Great. I think Shams, this question takes us back to the initial, um, you know, the north-south dichotomy that we were speaking about as well. Is what is needed to contextualize cure feminist politics beyond a West as oppressor East as oppressed or traditional versus modern polarity. It would be really lovely to even understand um, how do you think perhaps the North has influenced um, certain ways of thinking, certain um, research dynamics, etc. when you're speaking about this? Well, that's, that's definitely an ongoing debate and uh, definitely a debate in, um, in progress uh, nowadays. Uh, well, for me, um, and here I refer uh, back to Evren about uh, the West is plural and multiple and the East is plural and multiple. And therefore, let's move away from seeing things as monolithic, as, as um, uh, monofaceted in a way. Uh, and let's not forget that also the West uh, or, or or bodies of reference or philosophy in the West, there are a lot of people from the so-called global South uh, who are uh, active in the West, who are academics in the West, and who contributed to the very existence and implementation to that body of references. Uh, so that's maybe the first thing to take into consideration, I think, to believe, to, to, to kind of, uh, th th that here the real West is very complex, but if we are talking about the West as symbolic, as, um, as, as, as simply a mode of oppression, that is just as something 
that represents what oppresses us uh, from the global north perspective, then to be honest, I have no problems with it being uh, put in a corner and being labeled as the oppressor. I don't have a particular problem uh, with that. Now, what is needed to contextualize queer feminist politics beyond West as oppressor and East as oppressed or traditional versus uh, modernity? I think here it would be uh, it's important to kind of look at our at our identities as multi-layered as well, and uh, uh, look at our um, our original identity as something that is not as essential as it claims to be. For instance, in the Tunisian context. Uh, we have been uh, struggling, we have a double struggle as feminists and also queer feminist research has a double struggle because on the one hand it is struggling against the generic homophobia and queer phobia and transphobia in its own society with its own people, with the people who are supposed to be their allies, right? And at the same time it is struggling against the colonial power of the West and at the same time, it is struggling against the feminist queer movement of the West who claims to be having what's needed to change realities or what's needed to make things work. Uh, I always speak about friends because that's the most complicated relationship we have with the West as Tunisians. But for instance, uh, the way the uh, queer movement or queer feminist research acts in uh, between, uh, let's say, the upper river and the, the, the northern river and the southern river of the Mediterranean is that the northern river always claims to bring us a toolkit with, with, the, with, with various tools and that if we use those tools correctly like they did 50 years ago, then we will end up having uh, gay marriage, for instance. That is sadly not true, and we have learned it the hard way, because now uh, the, the queer and feminist movement in Tunisia has been trying to build an identity of its own. I don't really have an answer as in um, this is the recipe of what we should or should not do. But I think that one of the things uh, that uh, one of the things that might serve as a starting point is this idea of the multiplicity of struggles that we are uh, that we are uh, leading right now, one against our own uh, homophobia and queerphobia, one against the other's homophobia and queerphobia, and one against uh, those who are supposed to be our allies but who have a paternalizing relationship with us. Um, sadly, sometimes the relationship between East and West, it recreates the patterns of oppression uh, that um, uh, that it claims to, to, to want to dismantle in a way. For instance, I do believe that sometimes the, the Western feminist movement acts like a pater patria in, with regard to feminist movements that are uh, from the so-called global South. Uh, we are fighting against patriarchy, but lots of what Western feminism is doing is patterns of the patriarchy. Um, uh, that's on the one hand. And I remember uh, very recently, because we also have uh, in Tunisia this also generational thing where the older generation of feminists is more inclined towards universal feminism, etc., and about uh, not creating any dichotomy be between East and West or North and, and South. And a more uh, a newer generation that is uh, more into uh, kind of at least trying to analyze or study that dichotomy. And I remember I have I was in a conference like this, and I have received a question from a very well known Tunisian feminist that we all love and respect so much. And she said, "Why are you angry against the West?" For instance. When I was younger, she said, I was happy to read Simone de Beauvoir. I was happy to read those Western thinkers. And I haven't felt any anger towards them. So why are you feeling this anger towards the West? And my answer to her was that it's not that we are feeling angry because we are feeling angry, but because uh, we are now in a moment, in a momentum of the feminist struggle and feminist research where emotions are acknowledged where you don't have to be extremely rational in order to be recognized as an activist or as an academic like it used to be. So maybe that's one of the ways uh, that can really help us contextualize or address this by kind of 
owning it and um, like giving the effect a place in our way of analysis. No, thank you for that, Shams. I think that was really um, quite descriptive and very useful to understand even from the Tunisian context. Um, I think something that's really stayed with me is how there have been intergenerational shifts and perhaps these intergenerational shifts don't have to be at war with each other and that they can be things that exist side by side, yes. Um, we also have a lot of answers coming in from the participants, but I'm going to give that a little bit more time and direct a question to Efren. Um, Efren, the question for you from us is, what is the meaning of intersectional feminist approach for the cure feminist movement for you, um, be it in your context or in your research? Um, thank you. Um, I will say maybe a couple of things that are kind of contradictory, but let's let's see how it works out. Because um, I was very interested in um, Sham's um, statement a little bit ago, like not this past question, but the one before, I think. Um, Shams, when you said that um, it, like activism has always been intersectional, it's um, it's you know, scholarship that has, you know, kind of um, maybe divided things up. I think that's true for some forms of activism, but not true for all. And and uh, what some, some scholars um, have documented um, in the U.S. context, and I'm going to move to the Turkish context, is, for instance, as um, with the turn to neoliberalism and with the uh, production of some token privileged minorities in the system, um, sometimes their version of an LGBT movement looks like, um, looks does not look intersectional at all. So like, you know, and they're not, um, and in fact, you know, there are some things that are maybe not always captured by intersectionalism, that intersectionality, we can chat about this, such as, you know, where an activist group stands vis-a-vis uh, -vis war and militarism. Um, that is not like, you know, it's not something that it's a structural thing and and um, the like critique of war and anti being anti-war and anti-militarism were really, really important points of like 60s and 70s activism everywhere in the world. Um, but they don't um, necessarily continue to be informing activism everywhere in the world equally anymore. So I think that there are some um, forms of activism, quote unquote, that are like, that are catering the unmarked categories of like white, you know, whiteness, maleness um, in the LGBT community that can look like more privileged, wealthy uh, white gay men. But I also um, think that the more, um, I guess the more, the diverse is not a term I like at all. Like I'm gonna try not to use like diverse or diversity, but the more complex the formation of your activists, activism and activist groups are, the more inevitably the movement itself is going to be um, complicatedly and complexly um, connected to various, um, forms of and interlocking forms of oppression. So when I first started doing research in Istanbul, um, queer activists were very much, so first of all, they were racially mixed. Like they, nobody had to say, hey, we also need to pay attention to the Kurdish issue or to, um, you know, other minorities like religious minorities as well um, in Turkey because they already were in the movement. Um, more or less, like no, like and but being like anti-militarism was something that was brought in um, more ideologically. You know, there were no veterans, for instance, of war in the movement who then said war is a terrible thing. I did it. This is how we need to rethink it. It wasn't, but but many of the um, male assigned and male so, male socialized subjects had to go do their military like service so then there was a question of like if we don't believe in this how do we politicize it um so uh i feel like i'm not being very organized in my answer i'm kind of um uh, traveling across various um sites but i um maybe one other thing that i can say because i've been thinking about one of the comments that i saw in the chat about the and shams responded to it 
um, the comment about where intersectionality as a term comes from and that it that it was invented by a black woman um, and black feminists is important. I think that's very important, but so is the um, circumstances of its invention and what it was responding to, which is um, Kimberly Crenshaw as a black feminist legal scholar was trying to say something about the impossibility for the law to address certain forms of inequality and oppression. Now, she did that through um, saying that taking, like, I mean, she was looking at legal cases that understood racism through black men's experiences and sexism through white women's experiences and said that you cannot put these two together and get a black woman's experience and the oppression that she has to live through. But it was done not to say, let's also find a way to include uh, black women's experiences. I think it was more, it was more capacious than that for me. It is a critique of the limits of juridical justice and how seeking like sort of rights as individuals will not perform the more radical structural critique we need to address the inequalities in the world and the oppressions and exploitations in the world. So, um, so I think that down to getting back to your question, on to sort of like sum it up, um, to me, the meaning of intersectional feminist approach for queer feminist movement is that um, we don't give up on um, under seeing and understanding the connections um, between different forms of oppression and exploitation, but also when we are presented with stories that might on the surface look simpler, we seek for something deeper. So I think like I'm I'm hoping that in that way, maybe research and movements can nurture each other a little bit. Like in my work, I do talk about the murder of a um, Kurdish uh, young gay man in Turkey during my research and how the story <clears throat> became a story of the murder of a gay man and his Kurdishness completely disappears in the news and in the stories. And what would it mean? What would that story look like if we kept that also at the center of the story since um, you know one can exceptionalize the life of one Kurdish gay man in the metropole, but in the rest of the country, you know, many Kurdish children don't even make it to that age of 26, like by the time they are killed by the government. So, so I think that to me, keeping the structural analysis going is to say that surely there are moments of um, violence that is, you know, um, murders towards one body and we need to um, say something about that too and we need to talk about family violence we need to talk about state violence but also understand you know under what conditions particular lives become more valued and more story worthy and under what conditions they just perish in mass and we don't even get to even hear those people's names right thanks everyone for that I think um you know, that last bit around, and I'm trying to link this back to what we think of when we think of an intersectional feminist approach to a movement. And I also think back to like a civil rights movement or any movement and how some stories become the right stories to tell and the right stories to garner attention. And what does that say about us as people, right? That we need a certain right type of story. Um, you need a certain right type of gay man to be the photo or the image of a movement as well. So thanks for bringing that up. I just uh, linking that back here. I think from what both of you have shared, what's really coming up for me is to see conflicting points as points of generation, rather than a point at which all conversation stops and nothing moves ahead, right? And also, how do we build movements that affirm these differing needs? I think there are a lot of questions from participants on that as well, and I will get to them. But I wanted to uplift something. Um, it's called the design justice principles. And the design justice principles beautifully talk about how when you design for the margins, you will end up designing for the center and how that could perhaps be an approach to research, could be an approach to popular culture, activism of other sorts as well. Um, even some of the examples you shared around 
you know, we want to be in person and we want even something as small as I want to see you and I want to be in that space with you when I'm having a conversation versus someone saying I would rather do this virtually. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm thinking of a lot of the disability justice movements and how for a lot of people in-person access can just be prohibitive and how these different layers can sort of come together. Like when we take an intersectional approach, um, if we're thinking of a cure feminist movement or if we're thinking of, you know, the traditional versus modern, uh, modernity pol uh, polarity, how do we hold space for these differing needs and how do we use them as a point for creation of something new? So I think you all have shared some great insights on that. Um, there are lots of questions from our participants. I'm going to give it a minute uh, if they have other questions, but I'm also going to share my screen and show you all um, what answers they've shared with us. Um, just a second. Just checking that you all are able to see my screen. Lovely. So there are a bunch of answers that are coming in when we think of um, what does intersectional feminism mean to you or to each of us? Um, a lot of them are around understanding differences and to use those differences as a common ground. Analysis of different forms of discrimination, um, awareness about multiple stories, even like as a methodology, right? As a way to do research, as a way to do activism and a way to understand the complexity of issues. And it's beautiful that all of this that's being shared by participants has also been reflected in everything that both of you have been sharing. Um, what I will do is I will share um, uh, snapshots of this on the Padlet link so participants can have a look at each other's answers in totality later as can everyone in Shams. We just wanted to share how much of a common reflection there is in the room and also that nobody has one common answer and the meaning of it is so different for each of us. Right. So I'm going to pick up some questions from chat. Um, there are a lot so you'll have to give me a minute. I think the first question that came to me a long time back was um, how do you deal with, you know, questions on has the West or Western thoughts influenced your work for both of you? Um, like, are those questions you feel comfortable with saying, yes, that has happened? Or um, do you not agree with that? Yeah. Maybe Shams, you want to go first? Uh, I would say definitely yes. Um, and in a way... Um, in a way, I think that if we have a certain awareness with the current dynamics between um, East and West or uh, North and South, uh, it wouldn't be really um, a problem if we use any references from the West or if we, are, if we are influenced by any Western scholars or philosophers or activists. Um, as a person, um, I'm, I, 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 I am, I mean, I do believe in the post-colonial approach, but I'm also internationalist at heart. And, uh, and I think that uh, we have to be aware of the non-monolithic nature of the relationship between S and West, and that we have to also um, uh, still trust and believe in concepts such as solidarity, sorority, etc. But those concepts, they must be informed by an awareness of privileges. For instance, I have no problem uh, working with feminist movements from um, the, the so-called global north or the so-called west or whatever, but I would like that collaboration or that solidarity or that work to be informed, to be aware and to be grounded. And I think that if those three elements are there, um, feminist research can, can be in a, in a nicer position. Thank you, Shams. Evelyn, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, um, I too am very much. Um, I, I do read and I'm influenced by like Western scholarship, but I will also, uh, along with Shams, will kind of unpack what that means a little bit because, I mean, this is like even scholars who I uh, who have really uh, pushed back against particular kind of um, colonial uh, ways of thinking about the global south, like I'm thinking of um, Chandra, Chandra Mohanty's seminal essay, Under Western Eyes, have very carefully, like they continually carefully say, I don't want to generalize something like Western feminism, because there are so many, I mean, I think that would be um, really um, equating Western with white, and we, we can't do that. And even like white poor and white rich are not the same thing. So. 
Um, so I think uh, there, and, and then there's the question of diaspora. I mean, I read Edward Said's Orientalism in America as a student in the English language, which is the language in which it was published. So is that Western scholarship? It's a little bit like, you know, so it's, it's um, tricky. I think to me, uh, maybe, maybe something to be, and I, I do agree with Chams. I think I also uh, like kind of tried to thread that post-colonial and um, kind of internationalist sort of tendencies and desires, like and kind of like suture them as, as much as possible. Um, I think that there's also a lot of really interesting sort of indigenous um, scholarship in America, quote unquote, in Americas, but also in the United States. So to me, I think maybe the, the what to look for is the starting point of any scholarship and what it seeks to serve, right? What are the questions asked? Who are the, and what are the, cons like what, what is the scholar concerned with? What is it that they seek to understand in the world? To what end, right? Why is it that they want to understand this? So, so to me, these are these are the, the questions I look at. But again, like I'm pretty much in in agreement with Chance that I will um, happily like scholarship wise. To be honest, like I also like reading things I disagree with because that's the kind of intellectual that I am. I'm not. I can't. That also feeds me in a way because it clarifies for me why I don't agree with what I don't what I don't agree like I don't um I don't have to like everything that I read uh but even among the things that I have liked so much and I have learned from so much uh, much of it is produced in the west and that has so much to do with the um current like you know with the past and current um power asymmetries in the world um, which are real, and I think we need to keep critiquing them and pushing back against them. But but to me, that doesn't go through um, not reading them. Thank you, Shams. Thank you, everyone. Um, very insightful answers. I have a bunch of questions for y'all. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep asking them. I'd love for both of you to jump in on both questions. Um, my only request would be uh, maybe we keep the answers a little shorter so we can get to more questions. But if you feel like you want to share more, that's okay. Um, so let's start with a question from Lisa. Um, their question is, do you think it is good slash necessary to bring the ideas and concept of intersectionality into new fields of research? So not social science, but for example, bioethics, especially fields that pretend to produce neutral knowledge, such as medicine. Should we use the term there, even if there is a danger of depoliticizing it? Whoever wants to take it first. Um, I can quickly say, and and I will try to make it quick to get to get more. Um, I actually don't think that would be depoliticizing the term at all. And in fact, I get students, pre-med students, biology students in my transnational approaches to gender and sexuality class who come to the classroom saying that I think it's a problem that we don't understand these like tr transnational power dynamics that shape people's gendered, sexual, racialized experiences in medicine. And I wanna bring that to medicine. So to me, it's extremely important. I actually don't want these things to be just in the gender studies you know, classroom or the feminist organizing, or, I mean, I think they, they should be everywhere. So I, uh, and I know that there's work that's being done around it. Thank you. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Just to build on this, actually, one of the main uh, tasks that the feminist research has started to do was to actually politize fields that don't look political. So that has been one of the things that we have been trying to do and that generations of, of feminists, whether in activism or in scholar, in, um, uh, or, or as scholars have been trying to do, they have been trying to demystify this neutral element uh, that is linked to the so-called rational sciences, uh, mathematics, medicine, et cetera. So I think that bringing intersectionality into those fields, it's part, it's a subtask out of this task. It's part of the task of the need of politicizing, uh, politicizing everything. And also just to, 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 to give you an example, uh, the feminist research has uncovered 
uh, uh, this 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 non-political aspect of medicine by showing how uh, medical discourse or scientific discourse has been uh, violent uh, and discriminatory towards women, towards the LGBTQ class, etc. So I think that bringing in intersectionality will help this act of uh, politicizing those sciences instead of depoliticizing the concept. Thank you. Very relevant. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question, but lots to talk to you all about after this panel as well. Um, there's a question from Fa Francisca. Please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong. Um, which says, how can I deal with the problem of doing research on practices and lived experiences of others on the one hand, and then analyzing the observances and the data in a way that might result in imposing my own categories? Sorry, I think I froze for a second, did I? No, okay, go ahead. I mean, <clears throat> no, maybe the Shams should go first this time. <laughs> Shams, go ahead. Well, I, I don't know. I simply don't know. It's I think it's our fate <laughs> to kind of live with that uh, ongoing thinking with regard to that. But I think that it's also nice to have uh, such such uh, such an issue in the back of your head. I think that the moment the uh, that issue is resolved is the moment where I start to question a person's result with regard to something. So I trust more someone who is struggling. I mean, I trust the research of someone who is struggling with that with that issue that has been mentioned in in, in, um, in the question about uh, doing analysis, observing, and then imposing one's own categories. So I trust someone who has that issue more than I trust someone who supposedly has resolved that issue. I did not resolve it. And I think that I don't recommend resolving it in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. And I don't even know that I have more to add. I don't think you can avoid it it's because categories will always be in positions like we were discussing earlier. No, no matter. I mean, there are no right categories that will not be in positions. They will always be. And that's part of what analysis does. But I agree with Shams that as long as we're not certain, so certain, um, you know, arrogantly of ourselves that we're doing an excellent job capturing everything that needs to be said. and and maybe. Um, one thing, maybe one like thing that I do that I think makes, that I would recommend that makes research a bit more sound is to look for contradictions because they're everywhere. And then we can understand what we're capturing, how much we're capturing. Um, uh, but I also agree that having that, um, question, um, travel with you as you do your research, um, and not being so sure is also very important. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, both of you. Um, there are lots of like reflections in chat to your answers as well, and how that this is important, like just reflecting an awareness of who we are is a part of the feminist research cycle, and also just stating your positionality because that doesn't shift, but being honest about it and being open to like questioning what that might mean in a research study is quite important as well. And um, we'll take one more question. We have a question from Julianne. Um, the question is, do you think that social media campaigns and other attempts of creating an intersectional feminist narrative in social media um, can have a long-term effect on research and society? And if so, how? Um, either of you, who wants to go first? I can go and I'm going to be short because I think that we have developed like this argument on social media, etc. For me, um, uh, short term, yes, maybe as a tool, as a strategy, but long term, I don't think so. And it's simply, uh, it's not because social media are inherently bad or because social media are inherently um, unadaptable to uh, feminist theory or feminist research, but simply it's because feminists do not have the ownership of those social media. And by not having uh, the ownership of, of, of those platform, I think that it would be um, somehow dangerous to kind of pursue a long-term work uh, with regard to those platforms. That's, that's, that's what, I, what I think. They can, I mean, Facebook can, or TikTok or Instagram, uh, some, some, some men can decide that they should disappear and they will disappear one day. 
Yeah, I completely agree with Shams. And I, I will also add that, you know, something I haven't said earlier. I mean, obviously there have been moments where social media has been extremely useful and, and at times continues to be for um for so the so kinds of social moments we're in and we're interested in. Um during Giza Park uprisings, Twitter was crucial um for people to be informed and keep being informed because um you know, non-social media is also owned by these conglomerates. You know, we don't own any of it. Like we don't own the social media. We don't own like, so um, you can't rely on any of these. Sometimes they work as alternatives and they create these kind of like fractures and contradictory spaces where we can kind of capture one for a minute and use it, but it is not reliable in the long term. I, I mean, I also think that we need to study social media a little bit more. I find it fascinating as a thing I don't find it so, you, like, for instance, the whole, and I do think that it has an, an effect on social life. So I, I do have a theory. It's just a theory. I literally have zero, uh, nothing. I have nothing to back this up. But I do feel that there's an interesting effect of trolling, for instance, on real life. And I don't know if this moved from social media into real life, or maybe it was always, there were always people, we never had the word for it, but there were always people who would troll certain spaces, certain social movements, certain debates. But I I do think that we need to understand um, how social media works, absolutely also keeping in mind the mater materiality of it, right? Like who owns it, what's allowed on it, a lot of people's accounts disappear, posts. I mean, it's just like, you know, Twitter gets banned in Turkey all the time. Like it's but it doesn't mean that it's a liberatory space as a result. It's just like, it's complicated. But I do think that um, we, it's, it's always good to remember um, the limits of these spaces as we um, keep taking advantage of them when we can. But um, as Sham said, never forgetting that, um, you know, they're, they're owned and controlled by, um, the one percent. Thank you, um, both of you. I think that was very insightful. Um, there's a lot of resonance with what you all are sharing, um, both in chat and in the sort of questions I'm getting. Um, however, unfortunately, we only have five more minutes. So I'm going to ask for closing reflections from both of you. I think a question that's come up a lot from participants and from our end as well is how do we shape new inclusive narratives by research and how do we use this as a way to join forces with women who may have given a lot but they may have kept excluding others right uh, maybe cure folks trans folks black women um so how do we build this inclusive research into our arguments i've tried to like put together like 10 people's questions into one um so maybe shams you want to go first and then everyone I feel like I don't have an answer to every question. <laughs> uh, it's actually, uh, it's a very sensitive thing to reflect upon, uh, especially that currently we are right in the middle of that debate, what to do. Um, really what to do, that's the question we keep asking ourselves and not simply within, um, uh, I mean, in academia and with uh, feminist scholars, but also in activism. I do believe that feminist methodology has provided us with the tool uh, that we can use in order to build more inclusiveness uh, in feminist research. And that tool is uh, the effect or um, bringing in uh, um, or, or or let me let me reformulate the effect or bringing in an approach that is both academic strong firm but that is also flexible in terms of emotions and feelings uh, feminist methodology has and feminist activism has brought us the concept of sorority that we can build on um, whether in activism or in academia in order to make our spaces and our research more inclusive but that's the general let's say direction but at the same time i think it's healthy also to at certain moments stop and say uh, we cannot go into this direction or i cannot work with uh, 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 certain people or certain ideologies or certain reflections. And I think that now we have reached 
a moment uh, in, in this, you know, neoliberal age where difference is always or diversity is always celebrated and um, the multiplicity of ideas, the plurality of ideas is always celebrated, etc. But sometimes we have to make a strategic choice to go with the ideas that are uh, more interesting and that serve uh, our struggles more than others. And I think that that requires a certain amount of courage that we need to equip ourselves with. And that does not necessarily mean uh, that we should deny uh, the element of the effect or the element of sorority in our uh, research and struggles. Yeah, I don't think I have a very, very uh, straightforward answer either, but a couple of thoughts maybe about the, the question. Um, so because I also come from a bit of a queer theory background, um, I do find the logic of inclusivity and inclusion um, something to be questioned because it assumes that there are some people always already included who are then going to engage in the act of including. So who is doing the including and who are those who are always already inside, um, right? Um, and, uh, and maybe instead of thinking of um, inclusion, maybe we can think of like, right, who is it that we want to be in dialogue with and who is it um, that we want to um, organize with, um, who shares similar um, ideologies with us, not the same, like right, we need to be able to debate. And I think for me, dialogue is also not like we're going to sit down and I'm going to convince you of the right thing to do. But I too need to be open to change, right? Like if we come to the table being so sure of uh, being the authority on something or having the right answers and solutions, then um, nobody's going to leave that like metaphorical table, like, you know, happy or or transform. So hopefully feminist activism and feminist uh, research also as a way to be transformed and to be open to be transformed. Like to me, that's also the, like, you know, a bit of a definition of love. And I'm taking that a little bit from Lauren Berland, but like that, like it, if anything, it has transformative power. And I think um, feminism also has that transformative power for all of us. So, um, maybe thinking together, organizing together, um, aligning uh, with others, not with everyone. I agree with Shams, it's not possible with everyone, um, but also being open and maybe even looking forward to be transformed in the process. Yeah. No, those are beautiful reflections. Um, thank you, both of you. Um, I just wanna say that I don't only feel like I learned a lot, but I feel very heard and I feel like I feel more comfortable with not having answers, but wanting to explore these questions. And that's such a powerful thing to do as speakers. Um, so really appreciate it, Evren and Shams. I'm very grateful to have had this conversation with you. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, we've had a lot of participants join us today. I have so many more questions for you, uh, but unfortunately we're out of time. I will share the questions uh, perhaps on the Padlet so people can engage with each other and think of these questions and answers together. A big thank you also to all of you who joined in and the wonderful Heinrich Pearl team. Uh, there's Naida, Joanna, Adna, who's unwell, um, Olivia, and also the interpreters. It's been lovely to be able to put this together with them. Today's conversation for me has shown me that feminist research truly is powerful in shaping narratives, surfacing the invisible, and also showing us pathways to what we may have thought, as, thought of as impossible, right? Like when I grew up, I always thought of things, they have to be right or wrong. But to know that you can sit down and approach things with, as Evren put it beautifully, with love and hope to be transformed and hope that change can happen is really powerful. Thank you.